Hi, and welcome to another Spurs video. I'm Ashley Miller. I work here at UT with the Spurs program, and I teach rhetoric classes. We are joined today by two very special guests, Megan Eatman and Connie Steele. Um, both of these women are rhetoric instructors here at UT. Megan used to work with the Spurs program as well, and they are currently assistant directors at the Department of Rhetoric here, um, true experts in the field, and they're going to talk to you today about stasis theory. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to them. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and to talk a little bit about what they study, and then they'll launch into their discussion. Thanks. I'm Megan, and I work on violence and visual rhetoric. I'm Connie, and I work on 18th century public address, and particularly, I look at the way public address might have been used by women in the working class. Okay, so today we're going to demonstrate how an argument looks, how an argument goes through different points of stasis. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what stasis theory is. So the points of stasis define different points of disagreement that people can have in arguments. And there are four. The first is conjecture. Conjecture is the big question. Uh, did something happen? Does something exist? Is there a problem? That sort of thing. And um, because many of you have seen crime dramas on TV, probably, I'm going to use a crime drama as an example. If you're thinking about, say, a trial that happened in a crime drama, uh, the conjecture, the question of conjecture would be, did someone kill someone? Like, did the defendant kill someone? So that's a question that asks, did something happen? That's conjecture. The next thesis is definition. Definition asked, what kind of an act was this? Or what kind of a thing is this, more generally? In the case of a murder trial, the definition question would be, if you killed someone, is that murder or manslaughter? That would ask, what kind of an act was this? That's a question of definition. The third is value. Was this thing a good thing or a bad thing? In the case of a murder trial, we may ask, well, we can see that this is murder, we've defined it, but maybe it was in self-defense, then that might be a good thing. Um, in other cases, we would say, no, this was in self-defense, so this was a bad thing. That's the question of value. And then our final stasis is policy. Policy just asks, what should we do about this thing? So in a murder trial, if we decided that the person had killed someone, and that it was murder, and that it was a bad thing, that they didn't have a good reason for doing it, then we would decide what should happen to them, what sort of punishment should they receive. That's a policy question. And then Connie's going to talk a little bit about the specific scenario that we're going to show you to demonstrate points of stasis. Thanks, Meg. Um, today, what we would like to share with you, because we know that you have been studying the DREAM Act uh, this year, we would like to show you what rhetoric and stasis theory might look like behind the scenes. Um, you may have seen a lot of um, public oratory or um, speeches. You may have been reading um, newspaper articles or other types of uh, public address that involve a certain amount of preparation, a certain amount of staging. So what we want to show you is the way rhetoric and uh, discourse and debate might work behind the scenes. So as you may know, the DREAM Act was stymied on the Senate floor. Uh, there were five Democratic senators that voted against even putting it on the agenda for a vote. Um, so I'm going to represent the views of those five senators. And Megan is going to represent the view of the Democratic majority. And uh, we're going to attempt to show you how stasis um, functions even at the level of behind the scenes negotiation, which is something that you might be able to apply even in your lives. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So we have a vote on the Dream Act coming up soon. And um, as a Democratic senator, I feel like it's your responsibility to go with party line, to go with the party line on this one. And vote yes. If, if we don't get the Dream Act through, it's going to be a real problem for us. We're going to look bad in front of our constituents, and we're not going to be able to get other agenda items passed. So the problem here is that we need to present a united front. Um, you're a part of that. You need to vote yes on this. Well, I appreciate your concern. Um, and I really also appreciate that you brought up constituents uh, because. 
constituents at the level of um, Democratic National Party is not the same as constituents in my state. In my state, my constituents are concerned about immigration and they're concerned about this act, and I represent them. I do not represent the entire Democratic National Party. And so in good conscience, I could not vote at the time to bring this uh, piece of legislation to the Senate floor. Well, I think what's happening here is that we're defining this problem a little bit differently. It sounds like you're thinking about this as an issue that's particular to your state and your constituents, but really this is a national problem. They estimate, the um, Department of Homeland Security estimates that there are over 10 million undocumented immigrants in the country, and they're spread throughout the country, and many of them are children. And the federal government really needs to begin to take action on this. And, you know, it's, it's really important that we take a stand, particularly in such difficult economic times when the American people are really looking to Congress to do something to come out of the recession. This is something that it's really important that the federal government does, so much so that I think that's really what the focus on this issue should be. Well, and that's precisely why I could not vote yes. Um, you see, as you've mentioned, there are millions of undocumented workers, and it's very difficult to come up with a precise number because they are, in fact, undocumented. So all of this is based on estimates and guesstimates. Um, however, uh, my staff's uh, research on the DREAM Act showed that this might affect between 55 and 65,000. Um, which is a drop in the bucket of 10 million undocumented workers. Um, in addition, this is kind of a bit of a, a feel-good band-aid uh, piece, which affects this very small and very specific portion of undocumented immigrants uh, without addressing the larger issue. Uh, and that's, that's really uh, what my constituents in particular are um, objecting to that by voting and passing something like this legislation, we might miss the bigger picture of immigration reform in general. Sure, I can, I can understand what you're saying. It sounds like when you look at this legislation, you're valuing it differently. It doesn't seem like for you this is something that you think your constituents are going to see as an actual solution. But I want to suggest that you think about it differently. Even though this is just a drop in the bucket, if the federal government doesn't do something, then you know we're going to look like we can't do anything. You know, Congress has had some of its lowest approval ratings ever, and if we can begin to get legislation passed that will begin to address the immigration problems, then that's going to make us look better. It'll make the Democratic Party look more positive. We'll get more support, and maybe we can begin to do more once we've taken this first step. So, for me, and I think for many of the party members. Even though this appears to be, you know, an act that isn't as important or isn't as effective, it can have a huge impact. And is this more important than it may initially seem? Well, and honestly, it's it's our position in Congress that has me concerned. Um, I'm not alone in voting nay on this particular uh, agenda item. Uh, there were five of us who had to vote on this. Um, and so there's a bit of diversity here in thinking in the Democratic Party, and I think maybe what we need to focus on is that although the five of us cannot vote with you on this issue, the five of us do need to get reelected so we can vote with you on other issues. Um, so I think we need to think about what our values and priorities are as a party and how that affects um, those of us who, depending on the issue, because this could change from piece of legislation to legislation, um, how we as a party deal with situations in which some of us have to vote nay in order to stay elected. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any possibility for resolution on this particular issue, but that's just something I'd like to uh, raise for your consideration. You know, you know, you make a very good point. If we don't want to hold on to all of the senators that we can, we're going to have continued problems. So I think I may have at least an initial proposal that can, can help us figure this out. And that proposal is just to table this for now and try to think about uh, what we can do with more time. So 
perhaps you and your fellow senators who had objections can begin talking to your constituents and thinking about what sort of legislation would work for them. And then the rest of the party can perhaps contribute to that. We can sort of work together to think of something that will work for your constituents and will work for the party as a whole and will maybe be more effective than what we currently have in place. And I imagine that would also involve pushing us past election dates, which will give you some chances to maybe try out those ideas in, a, in an environment that will allow you to get a referendum on them. If you can sort of begin to introduce the ideas in a way that you know, is respectful of what your constituents want, and they still elect you, then that will give you and us a good idea of what they want and what sort of immigration legislation they'll support. So, how does that sound to you? Well, I definitely agree that timing is often key in issues like this. Um, I'm not sure that timing alone would be enough, but I would definitely be open for discussing further what our, our policy could be on this issue and on issues like it. Um, what if we adjourn for lunch and um, our chief of staff could uh, perhaps rally up the other four senators uh, who voted who, as I did, um, perhaps we could mesh something out together later in the afternoon. Um, I can't make any promises, obviously, because I'm responsible to my constituents, but I, I do want to be supportive to my party in any way that I can. That sounds great for great to me. I'll see you after lunch. Okay. Um, Thanks for me. You're welcome. Okay, so in that argument, we just tried to demonstrate how people can have disagreements about different parts of an issue. So in the beginning, we had disagreements about what the problem was. That's conjecture. I felt that this was a national problem that we need to deal with at the national level. But Connie, representing a senator, felt that it was more important for her to think about things at her own level, like her constituency and what they would want because she's responsible to them. We then sort of moved into a definitional argument where we talked about um, whether this is an issue that concerns the whole nation that has to be addressed at this level and whether that can be separated from Connie's concerns. Um, ultimately, it didn't sound like it could. It sounded like those were sort of related issues. So, we switched and began talking a little bit about the value of this particular legislation. Connie felt that her constituents weren't going to support this legislation because it was a mandate, because it didn't do enough to address the immigration problem. So once I was sort of convinced that perhaps this wasn't legislation that was going to be very good for Connie's constituents or maybe that great for the country, we moved on to proposals. I had suggested that we take some time and that perhaps Connie and the other senators who did not approve of the DREAM Act talk a little bit about how legislation could be formed that would be a little bit better for their constituents. Um, and then we table the issue for now. Connie agreed that it was best to table the issue and propose that we get the other senators together after lunch and maybe start thinking about this a little bit more. Um, from there, we, we adjourned for, for lunch. So hopefully if you go back and look at our argument, you'll be able to see how we move through different points of disagreement. And in recognizing those, that can help you enter an existing conversation, because you can figure out where the point of disagreement is, as well as analyze existing conversations and, and existing arguments. You can see in individual arguments, what point of stasis is this rhetoric disputing? And that should help your understanding of rhetoric overall. And um, I also just wanted to highlight that we're not representing Democrat versus Republican. We're representing disagreement within the Democratic Party itself. And these are very um, important points, especially for stasis theory, because any group that you're a member of, your, your family, a local community organization, if someday you wind up running for office, you will need to find ways to come to agreement even on what the basic questions are that you're debating. And um, stasis theory can be a really great way to do that and bring negotiations back on track by figuring out exactly what the question is um, that's, that's up for debate, how it should be defined, what everyone's values and priorities are in terms of solving that problem, and then coming up with actual policies and plans um, to solve problems or to resolve conflict. So um, we really enjoyed uh, working with you today and good luck with everything um, 
with spurs and with college.